The first Turrumbong Half Marathon was held in September last year, and it proved so popular that organisers quickly started preparing for this year's event. Ultramarathon man Cliff Young was special guest in 83, but he's still recovering from his Melbourne Sydney effort and will not take part this year. The winner of the inaugural race, Michael Beastie of Newcastle, will have some tough competition in his bid to make it two in a row. Laurie Whitty, former national cross-country champion and top marathoner, Jody Kearns, Brian Morgan and last year's second place getter Robert Spilling will battle it out over the 21 kilometre course. Last year's winner of the women's section, Karen Salmon, will run again. Karen is in top form, having won the Terrigal to Gosford run three weeks ago. The half marathon starts at 8am on Sunday from the school in Avondale Road. was raised by bowlers from the Hexham, Waratah, Mayfield, Diggers and Beresfield Club. It was handed over today to Sister Pauline Murray from the Martha Hospital by the President of the Waratah, Mayfield, Diggers Club, Mr John Faulkner. Each of the three bowling clubs held a number of fundraising functions for the cancer appeal and all are proud of the total raise. The money will help to fund the Martha Hospital's new med 2 oncology unit, which is presently under construction. The first stage of new med 2 is scheduled to open in mid-1985. <laughs> the former public works department site, the adjoining building and the old police station situated in Newcastle's east end are to be restored under plans by Newcastle developer Kurt Riccardi. The Minister for Public Works, Mr Berrison, says the New South Wales Government has entered into formal negotiations and work quick again before the end of the year. He was the only developer to tender for the project. One of the conditions of development involves the Newcastle Heritage Centre, representing about 15 conservation and historical groups. They will restore the former police station and use it to display for the presentation of environmental and educational programs. As architect Brian Suits explains, it will be a central location for environmental groups. For all the heritage groups in Newcastle, not just one or any uh, sort of one who's got the loudest voice, but uh, for all the uh, heritage groups and conservation groups in the Hunter region, they will have a shop front here. Mr. Bacardi says the other buildings will be used for commercial purposes, similar in concept to the Star Hotel development. At this stage, he's almost sure the government will give the final go ahead. In principle, everything has been approved, in principle, and uh, I would say about 90%. It's expected the entire site will take about two years to complete. No one was more surprised about the selection last night than Rex. Originally from Cox Harbour, Rex Wright has played for North Newcastle for five years. He was notified about the selection at 7.30 last night when he took a phone call at the Leagues Club. There were plenty of friends and family to toast his good fortune, but after the initial shock, Rex began to think about his new appointment. At the moment, I've, I've just got to try and cement myself in the team, try and get to know the players that I'm playing with now, and... Um, just continue on the way I am, try and t play the football I have been playing and just hope that the collectors keep on looking for me. You have your sights set on Sydney? Well, at the, at the moment I'm at college at um, Newcastle CAE and I'm, I'm finishing my, my diploma course this year in physical education and I'd like to finish my degree, which is another year at college, but um, I'm just w waiting. I'm, I'm, I haven't made any plans at the moment.
As far as junior soccer is concerned, this is one of Newcastle's biggest events. 250 players from 24 teams in the region competed in the minimum five days round of the series yesterday for under 89 year olds. The event was organised by the Mayfield United Junior Soccer Club. It was a stiff hanger of a finish for the runners up in Division 1 of the under 9 year old section. The winner, Merriweather, was decided on penalty kicks against all wins. In the under 9 section, Division 1 was the first time. Division 2, Rutherford. The under 8 year old section was won by Adamstown in Division 1 and Commandment in Division 2. Along with the team trophies, players also received their own keepsakes. in our region this weekend. Three people died on the Central Coast on Friday. The following day, two women from the Nelson Bay area were killed in separate accidents. And if that was not enough to end a week of carnage on the road, another three died in car smashes yesterday in our region. Mr Brereton's promise has been criticised by a number of groups. Head of the Northern Disaster and Rescue Branch, Sergeant Anforth, says driver concentration is what's needed and he's also called for cover penalties against careless motorists. It has been one of the state's worst weekends on the road and a gruesome end to the school holidays. The report was prepared by Mr. Brian Sylvia, a partner in the Sydney chartered accountant firm Ferrier Hodgson and Company, who was appointed official liquidator of the Broadmeadow Land Investment Company a week ago. In the report, which runs to 26 pages of facts and figures, it's revealed that the company had assets of $2.93 million available to meet liabilities of $5.04 million. Another partner, Mr. Andrew Love, assisted in the investigation. As a result of their initial inquiries, they requested the Corporate Affairs Commission to investigate the company as to possible breaches of both the company's code and the Crimes Act. Mr Love said the company had been insolvent for about four years and its losses were accelerating. He said the borrower's ledger revealed loans of $1.2 million made to a local solicitor, Mr K. King and his wife, and seven companies with which they are associated. Mr Sylvia has now been appointed provisional liquidator of those seven companies. Broadmeadow Land Investment's major creditors are 841 depositors who are owed approximately $5 million. The draft report indicates the return to them will be around 58 cents in the dollar. As and when received surplus funds from the realisation of the company's assets, we will immediately pay interim dividend to the creditors and depositors the nature of the company's major asset uh, is that it is in the form of uh, mortgage advances, most of which mature beyond 1995. However, we have been approached by a number of uh, major finance companies who are interested in purchasing this particular asset, and if we are successful in uh, making a sale of this particular asset, it will result in substantial funds becoming available a lot earlier than anticipated.
so hard this demonstration. The Department of Youth and Community Services, which provides broad guidelines for the establishment of such centers, granted 27,000 dollars to the rent of the premises and to pay the for 2,500 part-time staff. Part -time staff. Part -time staff. Part -time staff. In opening the center, the members of Maitland admitted that they were unable to pay for the rent of the premises and to pay for 2,500 staff. In opening the center, the members of Maitland and Mr. Walsh cautioned that the money was only a starter and that the center will have to raise its own funds in future. The idea for the center goes back to 1979 when an information service was opened in Raymond Terrace Library. It was recognized then that Raymond Terrace and the whole Port Stephen Shire is growing rapidly, with a big population of transient workers and new residents who need information and advice. The Neighbourhood Centre will provide that, as well as adult education, access to legal aid, and advice to people and organisations trying to improve their lot. I asked coordinator Mrs Judith Driscoll whether or not there were already plenty of organisations which provide these services. Every time a new service starts up, people say, is it going to duplicate other services? And the answer with regard to the Port Stephen Shire is that there are very few services existing for it to duplicate. So whatever we do, almost, is going to be new. Great. The $4 a bail charge was to have been imposed on growers sitting their books in New Castle to Sydney. In effect, it would have discouraged yeah. growers from well, sending their books to New Castle uh, and we're, in the long term perhaps brought them in to walk down to the New Castle Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the federal member for New Castle, Mr Alan Morris, were instrumental in convincing the Wall Council to drop the charges. The Chamber of Commerce is confident that within the 12 month deferral period, the Council can be convinced of Newcastle's well, efficiency uh, as a Wall Centre. The President, Mr Peter Evans, says the Chamber will also try to have Newcastle reinstated as a port for wool export. So we're quite satisfied that when we've examined this, and we've got plenty of time to do it now, that uh, we'll be able to show that Newcastle should be uh, not only maintained but extended in terms of um, car uh, wool cargo export. Mr Evans revealed today that the Chamber of Commerce and Industry intends to approach the state government about the numerous taxes and charges it imposes on business. The Chamber's biggest concerns are land tax and water rates. Mr Evans says the methods of assessing those particular charges are unfair. What's happened is that properties which were valued in 1981 and 1982 at a certain figure have gone up um, sometimes as high as three or four hundred uh, and more percent. But the land tax charges have gone up in some instances by three thousand percent. In the local scene, the commerce and industry are subsidising other ratepayers in electricity areas and also uh, uh, in particular with regard to water rates. And we've made submissions to the Water Board over several years that the use of pays principle should be applied in the commercial sectors. Uh, unfortunately, the basis for payment of rates by commerce and the small water uses is an unfair one. To flush a toilet and to have a, have a, um, a sink within your business uh, uh, premises could cost you seven or eight thousand dollars, whereas on a use of pays principle, you might be paying four or five hundred dollars. The Newcastle Trotting Club saved towels under the new lights last night. Additional lights have been mounted to the towers following the demolition of the former structures around the outside of the centre ring. Last night's training and qualifying trials are a dress rehearsal for Saturday's meeting, the first held on the Broadmeadow track since the old lights were dismantled. The club has had a few teething problems with the new tower lighting, but as club president Mr Henry Smith explains, Last night's trial run proved successful. We've had to do a little bit more work through the week just to highlight the horses in the straight. And most of the shadows have gone now and it's very good for the horses. The, most of the drivers are very pleased with the lighting. To spend that amount of money you must be fairly confident of this uh, Broad Meadow track? Well, we've spent 20000 but it had to be spent to maintain racing in the area. So we had no option there. We had to go ahead and do that. Um, in the future sometime they may raise at Beresfield but we had to keep this place going until such times as Beresfield becomes a reality. Thank you. 
an impact of around 80 years time, Living Pool has now claimed some 1,500 parts to a commercial license standard. The has has staffed 35, operates 40 aircraft and two simulators and a unique computerised training program. Understandably, such training does not come cheap. The eight hundred course costs about sixteen and a half thousand dollars. The school's founder and general manager Jim Spark says the high cost of training should be subsidised, as it is in almost every other profession. It's an extremely strong case. It's one of the few professions which attracts, attracts absolutely no subsidy whatsoever from anybody, the government or the industry itself. But if that subsidy exists you'd have to discriminate fairly carefully to make sure that people weren't just learning to fly for fun. Uh, one of the uh, biggest problems the industry have, has is being able to choose its trainees rather than be chosen on the ability to pay. And you think uh, subsidy would help you find the cream of the crop oh, as without, a professional pilot? Without question. Uh, you can only uh, look at the Air Force. Uh, they select, they pay and uh, they get the best. took part in a council convened meeting on Wednesday night to select conveners of subcommittees responsible for organising Newcastle's involvement in the bicentennial celebrations. At the time, all appeared quite normal to Alderman Rigby and could be found out that the original steering committee was never invited. When I rang the town clerk this morning, uh, he uh, wasn't too sure who the original steering committee was. I thought that the original steering committee was at that meeting and I thought that when we had the uh, committees read out to us that this had been arranged and was okay with the original steering committees. And then when uh, Alderman Geddes nominated from the chair uh, seven of the nine committee conveners, I thought that this also had been arranged with the original steering committee. So what concerns you about it all? Well, now that we've got... Uh, two committees. We have a, an original steering committee that as far as I know has not been disbanded and we've got a, uh, a meeting that took place last night where the, the original steering committee wasn't invited and we've convened, uh, we've got all these conveners to start all these committees going and we haven't even uh, uh, consulted these people at all. Well do you think this is satisfactory? It's quite unsatisfactory as far as I'm concerned. And what are you going to do? I will be uh, moving in next council meeting or probably in PNP on Tuesday that the uh, meeting be uh, disbanded and we call another meeting. I'm very confident that we'll go pretty well this year. We've got a, a very strong one side and our, our young guys in the number two side, are, they're very, very good. Four training sessions, do you think that's enough to cement the team? Yeah, four training sessions for guys at this level, yes, because about 13 of the guys went to New Zealand last year and played together and the under 21s have been to a carnival. Of the 16 of those guys that are playing, they've, they've played uh, two games over Easter and uh, a few training runs. So. Last year you came fifth, where are you going to come this time? First this time. We'll win the Corval Cup this year. <laughs> 